say the game is getting old. Monday morning and your coffee's cold. Life is not what you want it to be. Hi everyone and welcome to a new direction. My name is Jay Izzo. Oh, 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 oh. do we have an amazing show? I know every week, I, Jay, you say the same thing. The show is great. It's fantastic. It's all, I'm telling you, it's amazing. The show is amazing. I, okay, look, I have this incredible, brilliant, wonderful woman. Her name is Jody Jackson. She wrote this book called You Are What You Read. Hold it. It's about how we consume the media and what it does to you psychologically. Yes, you heard what I said. Is It's how we consume the media and what it does to us psychologically, emotionally, and what it does to our will and how it influences us. And she's got solutions. She's gonna. She's done the research. She. She. Matter of fact, she is amazing. You're. She is so good. Matter of fact, let me tell you something. She's a speaker and everything else like. It, and, and she's so brilliant, but I'm telling you, if she read the back of a box of cereal, you would be so enamored with her and her voice <laughs> that it would be the most beautiful thing you've ever heard in your life. That is that is who she is. And she didn't, I told her I was going to say something, but she didn't know what I was going to say. And so you can hear her kind of laughing in the back. Because I'm telling you, if she read the back of, of a bottle of Clorox, it would be unbelievable. Okay. Because she just has this beautiful voice and she's so witty and she's so smart and she's so brilliant. And I am so excited to have her on the show. And so, uh, the book, you are what you read and, uh, how changing your media diet can change the world. And so I want to thank everybody who's joining us right now on Facebook live Castbox FM. And for those people on the Oak 93.5 in Raleigh FM, uh, for those of you who'll be listening to the show, I uh, want to thank you for joining us and please make sure that you tell them that you really enjoy a new direction, but let's do what we do every week, right? Let's, 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 let's start out with, you know, you know what I believe, right? We're four part people. We're physical people. We're mental people. We're emotional people and we're spiritual people and so let's check in with you in those four areas of your life on a scale of one to ten one being miserable ten being outstanding how are you doing physically today folks how are you doing out there all right you feeling good you feeling all right everything going okay you you getting some exercise eating right doing all the things you're supposed to do right you know m- maybe you're having an ailment because as a result of maybe not doing some things right so you need to make some changes so what is that number for you, right? Five is average. So what is that number between one and ten, right? You got a number? Okay, good. Okay, whatever that number is, doesn't matter what the number is. I'm not expecting you to get to a ten, but what I do expect is what can you do right now? What can you change right now physically that can get you to the next number? And if it's not the next number, what can cha- what can you change right now to get you to the next half number physically, right? Because there's always something we can do, right? There's always something we can change. We, we can add cardio. We can take a little few more walks. We can do a number of things. Eat, change the way what we're eating, change what we're consuming into our diet, right? There's a number of those things that we can do. So what can you do to change to get your number? Okay, so you got a physical number. That's good. All right, second, mentally. How are you doing on a scale, that same scale, 1 to 10, 1 miserable, 10 outstanding? How are you doing mentally, right? And and you know what I mean, right? We have two halves of the brain. We have a right side of the brain. We have the left side of the brain. The right side is our creative side. The left side is our logical side. What are you consuming in your brain? Is it is Are you just sitting there watching the news every day? Because I got to tell you. It's not working both halves of your brain like you think it's working. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell you right now. And matter of fact, TV is not working both halves of your brain like you think it's working right now, right? Because it's it's coming at you. You're not doing anything actively to work with it. I'm just telling you. I know you don't want to believe that, but I'm I'm just I'm just saying it's it's really true. So what are you gonna do, right? To really work both halves of your brain, that creative side, that that other that one side, the right side, and then that logical side. What can you do? What can you change? What can you consume? What can you read? What can you actively do to mentally grow in knowledge? Because let's be honest, right? The brain is something that we can actively, regardless of your age, right? You know, you don't have to retire from that. Okay. So what is that number for you on a scale of one to ten? Five being in the middle. All right, you got that? Good. All right, so we got two numbers. It leads us to the emotional number, right? What do you mean by the emotions, Jay? Well, isn't that like mental? No, it's different. So the emotional number, that is like your emotional intelligence or your emotional quotient, right? Like, like how well are you able to control your emotions as part of it, right? Do the little things irritate you when somebody cuts you off? I had 
got to tell you, I had a bad day. Somebody somebody cut me off, and then I, you know what? I didn't do my emotions very well. I'm just going to be really honest with you. And if you were to ask me at that time how your emotions, my emotions would have been a two, okay? Because I really wasn't very good. And I recognized that why did I get so emotionally upset because somebody cut me off in the middle of the road. And, you know, a lot of times what happens is you don't even recognize that you're building up your emotions. And then the next thing that happens is little things will start to trigger those things that shouldn't. And so, you know, I recognize that I got to do some work here. Why would that make me so upset? You know, that's part of it is I, you know, I know I've got control. I've got choices emotionally. I don't have to choose the spe- a specific emotion. I can choose whatever emotion I want to choose if I'm willing to do it, which leads us to the second part of emotional intelligence, and that is how well are you able to tune into the emotions of others, right? Sometimes what we do, you're going to hear um, Jody later, she's going to talk about affect, right? That's our psychological term for, you know, how, what our emotions are doing, right? We call it affect. And so, you know, what are you doing? How is, how does, how does things work for you when it comes to uh, your emotions? Like how well are you able to tune in? How well are you affected? And what happens when those emotions are affected to you? You know, what, what happens to you, right? So it's all about intention and control and, and impulse control and those type of things. So on a scale of one to 10, one being miserable, 10 being outstanding, what is that number for you emotionally? And then, you know, what you have to ask yourself is, okay, the same question, you know, what can I do to change that, right? Okay, so you got three numbers, right? The, which leads us to the last piece. And the last piece of that is the spiritual. And a lot of people say, yeah, Jay, I don't believe in God. Okay, well, that's not what I said. I said the spiritual. And you go, well, what's that? And I go, well, the spiritual is the stuff that's all left over that we can't explain or that we will never explain. Quite honestly, it, it there's something inside of us. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about the soul, right? You know, music will touch the soul. It's a, it's a place that we can't explain, but we know that it changes us or gives us a piece of, sense of peace or centers us in some way. And so what happens is that that spiritual area, that area that allows us to go back to center and have that peace, right? How are you doing in that area? Scale of one to ten. One being miserable, ten being outstanding. How's that going for you? Right, because you know, if if you know, it can be sometimes it can be so many different things, right? If it's God, how does that working out for you? Is it, is it giving you what you want? Secondly, you know, if it's if it's not if it's not God, and let's say it's karma, how's karma working out for you, right? Or maybe it's nature, or maybe it's something else. Whatever that is, how is that working out for you that makes you feel spiritually centered? Right. That's that's the piece that we that we're talking about here. So you've got the four numbers, right? The you got the physical, the mental, emotional, and spiritual. Those four numbers are like the chair that you sit in, right? If they're uneven, it's kinda of hard to sit in that chair, isn't it? And if the chair is too low, well, it makes things a little tough on the back and the legs, doesn't it? So the whole idea is to get your chair exactly to to the place where it needs to be, right? It's an upper number, and that's all level because we want to stay really well-balanced. And speaking of well-balanced, because uh, my next guest is absolutely phenomenal. Her name is Jody Jackson, and she comes to us all the way from London, England. Yes, that's right. She's in London, England. And she has a master's degree in applied positive psychology from the University of East London in the UK, where she has investigated the psychological impact of the news. As she discovered evidence of the beneficial effects of solutions-focused news on our well-being, she grew convinced of the need to spread consumer awareness. She is a regular speaker at media conferences and universities. Uh, she had the, Her book, this book that I'm holding up for those of you who could see it, uh, you Are What You Read has just come out into the United States. It's absolutely a fabulous read. She is really, I think she is the expert on the psychology, the impact of the news on mental health and the health of our society. She has uh, done so much research. And not only that, let me just tell you something, this little, this little other stuff, right? So so the other piece of Jody is this. She's also a qualified yoga teacher and life coach. Yeah, you didn't know that, did you? So anyway, she's going to be fun and she's great. And so ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Jody Jackson. Jody, welcome to A New Direction. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be on. Yeah, I. you know what? I got to tell you, I, I love this book. I... I Thank and you. I, I really did. I, I really do. And let me tell you, I'm going to share my story because I think that uh, quickly, because I think this is a similar story for so many people. And maybe we can jump into that that way. But I stopped watching the news several years ago. I mean, I just stopped. I, I do not watch the news. I do not watch local news. I do not watch uh, national news. I don't watch any of it. And I did it because I. I found myself getting angry and frustrated and 
even though I knew uh, all, you know, having be, being a psychological professional, thought I knew everything, but I something was drastically wrong, and I didn't like the way I was feeling. I didn't like the way I was feeling towards others. I was outspoken. I was ridiculous, and I would hear myself, and I was like, "This is awful." I'm an. I felt like I was an awful human being, and I stopped watching the news. And this is back in about 2012. Mm. I have never been happier. (laughs) 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 I'm just going to be honest with you. I have never been happier in my life. I have been more creative. I have been more, uh, I have, I have been able to do more things, positively influence more people. And people say I'm naive. I'm not, I, I clearly know what's going on in the world. It's hard not to. But I just don't consume it anymore. And and is that part of the reason why you wrote this book? Yeah, definitely. You know, I had a, I had a very similar experience to you. Um, and, and what I realized from sort of investigating it further is this is the same experience for so many. And actually finding the news too depressing is the biggest reason for audience disengagement. So it's a really it's a really sort of important place to start and ask, you know, why this is happening and what would it take to keep us informed in a way that kept us engaged and empowered. And um, yeah, you know, I I found the news, it it was changing my worldview. You know, I was a bit of a news junkie and and consumed it every day. Um, and, And then I found myself not able to watch even one story. And, you know, that was a really gradual progression that moved me from someone who, who watched it daily to someone who could no longer stand it. And I, I get called the same things. You know, when I stopped watching it, people called me naive, weak, um, ignorant, and they thought that it was an extreme reaction. And it, it this this label that other people gave me made me feel that I was um, damaged in some way, you know, that there was something mm-hmm. in me that wasn't strong enough or brave enough. Um, to see the world in, in all of its ugly existence. But when I began researching it and when I shifted my focus, I really very quickly came to realize that it wasn't me that was damaged, but the news industry. Mm. And this is when I realized that it wasn't about not watching the news, but it's about consuming it in a different way, in a more deliberate way, you know, in a way that informs and empowers us rather than misinforms and disempowers us and so that's why i wanted to write this book to detail this and and help others understand the impact as well as um give them the tools to to take greater control over their relationship with it to make sure you know it's serving them rather than they're serving it Mm, beautiful jody jackson is joining us uh book is entitled uh you are what you read how changing your media diet can change the world it's a great matter of fact i read this book in a i read this book in a day Okay, I, I mean, literally, I couldn't put it down. I started reading it. I could not put it down. I I just was so blown away by the book because the book just spoke to me so strongly. And I believe that it will do the same thing for you. This this book, of uh, course, has been in the UK since I think about 2016, but it's just come out to the US of A. And it's, of course, available on Amazon and your favorite bookstores. And if they don't have it, you can just say, um, please get it in now because I got to have it in there. And so tell them that I want Jody's book in my bookstore now. Get it here because people are going to want to read this. So please do that. And um, so, Jody, right from the very beginning, I want to just quote something that you said in the very beginning of the book. You said, many of us believe that we create our own beliefs and opinions about what we read in the news. In reality, many of those beliefs and opinions are created for us. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a big one to unpack there. Um, it's, it's, it's based around the idea that You know, the news is our window to the world. It helps us see beyond our own experience of it. And it helps us also understand what we are currently experiencing. So it has a really powerful role in, um, you know, allowing us to connect with our communities and, um, you know, borders beyond our, our own to actually see what's going on in the world. And, and when we look at this, you know, the, 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 the big problem that we have is the window and the frame that the news sits in. Because in the UK, for sure, and I know in the US, there's a mantra that kind of drives a lot of newsrooms, which is if it bleeds, it leads. Mm. And the problem with this is it means that the news, that window that it's creating for us, it's not actually it's not actually a reflection of everything that goes on. It's actually giving us a reflection of everything that goes wrong. Mm. So when we look out that window, 
you know, we can see the most extreme stories of problems, wars, corruptions, uh, murders, famines and, and natural disasters. And, and that actually becomes all that we see, because at the same time, it gives us a very small window or even a non-existent one of stories about solutions and progress and peace building and development. So we're not able to actually see them and be aware of them. And and in psychology, you know, the more often we see something, the more common we believe it to be. So this is known as availability theory. And the less we see something, the less common we consider it to be. So this overrepresentation of problems and this underrepresentation of solutions, it gives us a very distorted picture of the world when we look out that window. And, um, and it leaves us with the feeling that the world's broken beyond repair and as if it's in a rapid state of decline. Um, and this isn't this isn't actually the case. But, you know, like so many like yourself, you just want to pull those curtains shut and, and not look out that window anymore. And that, you know, that creates its own host of issues as well. So it's about, um, you know, how can we. How can we kind of knock the wall down and see the world for what it is, good and bad? We're talking with Jody Jackson, author of the book "You Are What You Read," and uh, we're going to we're going to be talking to her more about this book in just a second. But we'll come back right after this. Hey, you know what? We need to say something about our sponsors. We have two great sponsors that have sponsored the show since the very very beginning. One of them is Inline Business Brokers and Advisors. They uh, have partnered uh, with us since day one, and you know what? They're going to partner with you. If you're a business owner and it's time to sell your business, then you know what you need to do? You need to contact the professionals at Inline Business Brokers and Advisors because the fact of the matter is they are internationally known. They are the best at what they do, and they do it all confidentiality. That's their registered trademark. So you can learn more, if you will, by going to Inline.com. That's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And also, Linda Craft and Team Realtors. It doesn't matter where you're at in the world. Linda Craft and her team can help you match up with the right real estate agent that what they can do is help you find to buy or sell a home. doesn't matter. They, they are the experts. They've been around for 34 years. They are known as the legends of customer service. They give legendary customer service. And you can learn more about going to lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And then finally, I need to do the t-shirt shout out of the day because I'm wearing epic physical therapy and uh, they gave me a free T-shirt, and you know what I do, right? If you're a local business, I will say thank you for the free T-shirt, and I just want to say thank you to Epic Physical Therapy for your sponsorship and for doing that for us. And you know what? Thanks for being a part of the show. And we're back here with Jody Jackson, author of You Are What You Read, and this is how why changing your media diet can change the world. And she has been so lovely and gracious to join us in, from London, England, and uh, with us today, and she, as you could tell, right, she's just brilliant, and uh, she's absolutely fabulous. So, I want to go through this book because this is what I love to do, right? And of course, I've I've dog-eared your book, sorry, but I really have <laughs> dog-eared your book like crazy. So, one of the things that I, I really found intriguing about this book was because of the psychology aspects of how how the news media affects us psychologically, and mm. one of the things is that Kurt Lewin that you point out in, I think it's the first chapter, Kurt Lewin was a psychologist and he says there are points along the communication channel where decisions are made about what stays and what is omitted and you talk about this in terms of the editorial bias. So Mm. talk about the editorial bias and how uh, this affects the way we are consuming news media. Well, I think from from a consumer point of view, it's really important to know that there is a production process with the news. You know, it although although they have objectivity as one of their kind of founding cornerstones, um, it's important to recognize the limitations with that. And so when when we are being given the news, we are not being given a version of it untouched. You know, it's not it's not coming from one place to us without any intervention in the middle. There is a huge production process that goes in place of making sense out of this information and making it something meaningful and giving it angles and making it interesting and finding ways to, to take our attention. Um, and so there are Kurt Lewin, he identified gatekeepers within the mass media. And so he said, you know, you've got the first person who sees the news happen. And it's important to know as well that, you know, as we're all um, we're all susceptible 
to the kind of rapid so, so, psychological processes of things like perception and selectivity and personal bias. And so these do perhaps color or shape some of the stories. It, it makes some things notice and some things not. Um, so so the person who actually sees the news happen, then there's the reporter who talks to that source and they decide, you know, which facts to pass along, how to shape the story, um, which parts to emphasize as being the most important. And then it goes to the editor who receives the story and decides whether to cut, add, change or leave it as it is. And then once it goes beyond there, you know, it might go to an aggregated broadcast channels. So, you know, it might make it to the big screen and then it's a different set of editors deciding which stories to leave in or um, take out. And then if it goes overseas, you've got a further gatekeeper who will decide whether or not it's worthy of their time. And what, you know, going back to, to what I said before, the more common, you know, the more often we see something, the more common we believe it to be, the more important we believe it to be. So the more channels that a story makes through these gatekeeping um, sort of avenues, the more important we consider it to be as an issue. And when every news station is talking about the same thing, you know, we really think it's of, of huge importance. And where we've got these kind of 24 hour news cycles now, where there's so much content, it's difficult to know the kind of information that we should be paying attention to that is a real threat that we um, need to be aware of. And, and the kind of more filler stuff that's used to entertain and keep us engaged and grow our attention that's perhaps preying more on our morbid curiosity than, than actually um, necessary information. So, th 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 all right. So one of the, I, I don't remember who said this, but you know that if you if you take a myth and you will say it long enough, the myth will become truth, right? And it will be believed, right? We, we can take a myth and we can just make it truth very easy as long as it's shared. If everybody has the same story and it's shared repeatedly, we can turn a myth into truth and make it completely believable. And I thought about this in terms of every channel here in the States, every channel is the same story, right? Mm. It's just a different version of the same story. Well, if you get the different version of the same story over and over and over and over again, all right, how, how, how difficult, if you have somebody who goes against that story and has a different take on it, do you know what happens? They become a liar, right? I mean, that's, mm. re that's really what happens, right? And so if you have everybody in agreement on a story, right, editorially, but you have one place that doesn't, they become the liar because they're, mm -hmm. they're now the outlier. And I thought this, I thought about this in, in terms of all that when you were writing this book, I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, it almost makes me believe, I, and I, I can't, of course, cannot prove this. I don't know that anybody can, but it almost makes me believe that all these, all these news media outlets kind of get together and go, the editors get together and go, this is going to be our top stories of the day. Okay, great. All right. Well, let's not do it in the same order, but let's make sure we hit the same stories and let's make sure we point out the same things. Because it literally feels that whether I go to MSNBC, ABC, CBS, CNN, they're, it's the same stories, just to, you know, with the same editorial twist. And, and I'm like going, oh my gosh, it's no wonder people want to believe that it's the truth. Right. It, isn't that kind of what Lewin and even Goffman. Right. Because we get the same, you know, the schematic inter, uh, schemata of interpretation. Right. We get the same images. We get the same. We get the same way the words that are used to convey the story. And then we all then all of a sudden we go, well, it's got to be real. Right. I've seen it on five different stations. Mm. Yeah. And there's, you know, the reason it probably replicates over so many as well is because you know, news organizations are competing with each other for our attention. And so if, you know, if it's being covered and it's getting traction, then they want to be reporting it themselves and they'll find a different way to perhaps, um, you know, go into it deeper or make it, um, you know, whatever, the, whatever kind of tools they have at their disposal to, you know, make us not watch it on that channel, but watch it on this one. Um, and, and yeah, you know, this, this kind of, um, this, this echo of a story, even if it's a really important one, you know, we're not talking about saying that blanketing all news under one canvas of saying, you know, it's it's bad for us. It's it's about recognizing that we have hit a point of excess with our media consumption. I think, you know, I think the average U.S. person in the U.S. sorry, um, spends 70 minutes, I think, a day absorbing news content and that's a that's a huge influence that it has on your mind and so when when these stories are overwhelmingly negative 
it's really important that we understand what effect that's having on us so that we can be equipped to actually make more deliberate choices rather than just kind of passively consuming what's coming through our feed or our, our usual channels of mainstream news. Mm. And it's so it's so so one of the things that I'm really interested in is actually speaking to the consumer um you know, I, I do like to speak about the production process of the news and make sure that um, we can all become a bit more media literate and understand the, the ways in which the news is given to us. But I really want people to understand what happens when it reaches us and how it affects us so that we can perhaps, um, you know, make different choices that help us remain informed, engaged, but most importantly, keep us empowered um, and feeling connected to, to our own potential to contribute to society. And and this is by the way we're talking with Jody Jackson, uh, author of You Are What You Read, uh, Why Changing Your Media Diet Can Change the World. It's available on Amazon, your favorite bookstore. It's it just got here to the U.S., so you need to pick up the book. It's outstanding. But uh, here's the thing, though, that I think struck me psychologically when I the reason why I said what I said is because, you know, one of the things that is absolutely true is that the people who uh, we see as the people who basically read us the news, okay? They're human beings. And mm-hmm. and when I, I, have, I have gone as far as watching, turning the sound off, trying to turn the sound off, turn on the, um, uh, what do they call it, where the words come, the closed caption, and turn the sound off, because what I wanted to observe is not listening to what they say. I wanted to observe when words were coming across the screen, what was their what was their facial reactions to things that they said? And what I found in my own piece of research here was that, you know, certain topics, because these people, these people who, you know, broadcast the news, they're voters too. When certain topics came up, their, their facial expressions changed based on the words. And I found that to be interesting. And I'm going, how, how influenced are we even by the person that we're watching, how they portray us the news Right as well, because I started to go, oh my gosh, we can we can get a different sense because people are human. I mean, you you even make the point we're human beings. We're we're going to be totally. We have to you know. There's two sides of it, right? We're going to take a look at this and we're going to go. And I started to realize I'm like going, you know, how could they? You know, if they don't agree with a particular topic or subject matter that they're saying, they're going to they're going to give themselves away, whether their eyes, you know, get mm-hmm. lower or their their jaw gets sterner or they don't open their mouth as wide or. Uh, they they have a severe tick. <laughs> uh, it's just that you know I think that all came played a part, and I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, I'm even being influenced. You know how easy is it to be influenced by who's ever doing the news, in mm. addition to that as well. And I just thought that was an interesting artifact, uh, you know, Definitely. based on your book. Book. I just think it'd be, I you know, of course, this is anecdotal. My research is anecdotal, not something that I've I've actually done in the laboratory. But it would be interesting to see if how many people could recognize a different uh, facial expression based on something that to see. I think that might be a piece of research that you and I should talk about after the show, um, yeah. <laughs> as well. Um, so one of the things that influenced you in this whole piece of really opening your eyes to the psychological effects of the news media was you tell the story about your mom, Eva, um, Mm. shortly after you had your daughter, um, Ariana, I think is her name. And uh, so shortly after that, you you had an eye-opening moment. Share the eye-opening moment and what, what it opened up for you. It was when I, you know, in this moment of joy of having your sort of first child, and um, and she said to me that she was really worried um, for my little girl in the world that she was going to have to grow up in because it was so much more dangerous than when she was young. And this this comment, you know, it didn't it, it really didn't surprise me because I'd done a lot of research into, you know, the way in which people considered the world and the, the perception of it being worse than the reality of it. And you know, when she said that, my immediate reaction was, wow, okay, hang on a second. (laughs) Let's just reflect on that comment for a minute. Because my mother-in-law, Eva, she was born in 1945. So she was born into a world war. Um, and, and, And what's incredible is that she thinks that the world is a more dangerous place today. And she's not alone in this kind of thinking, you know, an astonishing 71% of Britons believe that the world is getting worse. But actually, since 1945, and we're talking globally here, 
um, you know, since then, we've actually become more prosperous. We have better health, better technology, better sanitation, higher IQs, less child mortality, fewer deaths from conflict, fewer homicides, and have seen a reduction in overall crime figures. And so, you know, with all of this progress, you think, how can it be that Eva would think that the world is more dangerous now, today, than it was 70 years ago? And, you know, you have to think, well, where does she get most of her information from? Because Eva's not an uninformed person. You know, she's incredibly bright, well-educated in terms of her information stream that she has. You know, she tunes in regularly to the news. So she's well-educated on, on, on sort of current affairs and issues that we're, we're told about. So she's not actually uninformed. What she is is incredibly ill-informed. You know, she has an incorrect perception of the world because, um, you know, like I mentioned, the pace at which the news has accelerated and they focus predominantly on the negativity. And what this does is it makes us think that these problems are accelerating. So it gives us the impression that the world is getting worse and the potential for it to become um, you know, catastrophic is always on that edge because we're, we're told of all these completely um, unresolved and, and powerful problems that we're facing regularly. And and that was a real moment that I ha I kind of thought, you know, this this needs to be I can't just be having this conversation one on one with Eva over a table. I need to put my research to work. I need to put this into a book. I need to actually reach so many people that think the same as Eva and myself at one point felt the same. And what I've become aware of from actually becoming much more media literate as well as shifting my focus to include solutions as well as problems. I'm not replacing one with the other, um, but I'm giving myself much more balance and much more variety in my media diet. It created a really powerful shift in my mood, in my behavior, in my beliefs, in my understanding. And I really wanted to be able to offer people a chance to have the same. And so, you know, that, that conversation was a real trigger for me to say, okay, let's Let's scale this conversation up. Let's see how many people we can talk to about this. Isn't she awesome? Her name's uh, Jody Jackson, and she. This is her book. Yeah, her book is called "You Are What You Read." It is about how the psychological, emotional effects of the media, what they are doing to you, and you probably don't even know. I'm telling you, you don't know. You think you know, but you don't know. Okay, and she's she's giggling at me all the way from London, England, because of my passion about this, because I am so passionate about people really coming to understand that you don't really know what the news media is doing to you and how it is influencing you. But she has written, I believe, the definitive book in doing that. We're going to be and, and you know what? We're going to be talking to her for a long time. Well, not a long time, but for, you know, for a while longer. But let's do this. So, you know, this program has been sponsored by Inline Business Brokers and Advisors, and Inline has been so gracious to sponsor this program. They have, uh, they believed in it from the very beginning. They have given their money and they have given their time, and we are so grateful to them. They have literally helped thousands of clients in the sale and purchases of businesses. So when it's time to sell your business, contact the professionals at Inline Business Brokers and Advisors. They do deliver the highest market value in the shortest amount of time with complete confidentiality. They are internationally known. Uh, they're amazing. And so check them out at nline.com. That's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors. You know what? They are known as the legends. They are legendary customer service. That's what they're known for. And they've been around for 34 years, and there's a reason why. And you should check out why they are known as the legends of customer service by going to lindacraft.com. Go to L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. And we are back here with Jody Jackson, all the way from London, England, and we are talking about her fabulous book, You Are What You Read, uh, How to Ch Why Changing Your Media Diet Can Change the World, and she has written this brilliant book, and it's absolutely fantastic, and by the way, we're only about to page 32 of her book, uh, <laughs> and I, I want to talk about all these little psychological things, but I knew that um, there's, I, I mean, I literally, when I, I take notes on the book, right, I mean, not only do I dog ear it and I highlight it, Jody, but... Then I take notes on it because uh, I, I because there's certain things that are real salient to me and I, I hope they're interesting to others as well. And so I'm going to kind of buzz down some of these things. Let's let's just talk about some of the psychology uh, here a little bit more and how this affects us because one and 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 also what the news media how that works because I think both you can't separate one from the other very clearly. I don't think. So one of the things that really stuck out to me 
was the negativity bias that you've kind of already talked about. But one of the things that people don't know is that the news media really in reality is rewarded for negativity. Right? I mean they, they, they get they get awards. Nobody's giving nobody's giving out the, you know, news media awards for those people who went, Oh, you know, a fireman saved six puppies this year. Nobody's giving them the a news media a year award, right? The anchor of the year award is getting that, right? It usually has to deal with <laughs> right, with with something terrible and horrible. Am, 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 did I did I misread that? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I suppose my my reservation was that you know, when when people talk about solutions journalism, that's usually one of the kind of examples is a fireman saving puppies from trees or cats from trees or these really kind of inconsequential stories that aren't actually newsworthy. And so the whole framing of the conversation of solutions journalism is immediately undermined because you're not necessarily talking about the incredible, powerful value that the kind of um, this kind of information can provide us with to help us understand the world better. So one of the things that I'm always really quick to do when people classify it and sort of pigeonhole it into into one thing is is to say, you know, it's not um, it's not fluff. It's not entertainment. It's not PR. Um, it's not lighthearted feel good stories. You know, when I talk about solutions journalism, it's much grittier than that. It's It's rigorous journalism that reports critically on tangible progress being made in order for us to understand how issues are being dealt with. Mm. So, so, you know, we still learn about the problem, but we also learn about how these problems are being resolved, what people are doing in response to them, um, what solutions are being put in place and ask if they're working. And it's not with the purpose of making us feel better. It's for the purpose of making us know better, you know, by giving us this more fuller and an accurate picture of the world. So that would be my, my sort of my first little caveat into that. Um, and the second thing is you're absolutely right. You know, there is a huge um, prestige and a, and a huge kind of accolade and award ceremony for people who risk their lives to bring us information from some of the most hostile environments. And, and there's a deep respect for the journalists that do this because it's incredibly important and they risk their own safety to bring us to bring us this truth and to give the kind of voice to the voiceless. So my criticism um, of the excess negativity, it's its not by any way a slander of their you know, courageous and important work. The, but the, the, the reason I bring these award ceremony into the um, into the into the book is to highlight what they're not rewarding, you know, to highlight the fact that they're not rewarding people who are are investigating solutions, um, which have a kind of real powerful, powerful narrative to play. In, in our lives to help us understand the world in a, in a much better way. And so there is this, the, you know, journalists aren't incentivized in the same way to, to create these kind of stories for us. And, and listen, I did not want to, I did not mean to oversimplify the process that it's about firemen saving puppies, because that's, <laughs> that's certainly not what, uh, you know, a solutions focused media that you're talking about is, because you do go through several examples of how solutions focused media uh, can actually solve problems and you know, test problems and what are people doing to try to solve the problem they're not just presenting the problem mm-hmm. I think you know which is really important I but I also think that you know people I think people also just are so disbelieving that that they can be controlled by a TV I just to me uh, Jody I people don't believe it you know, you talk about in your chapter called Too Much of a Good Thing, you talk about the exposure to the negativity bias and how it negatively affects our mood, increases our anxiety. We have get feelings of helplessness. We increase our feelings of contempt. We increase hostility towards others. We are desensitized to people and to information, and we start to care less about the world. And you go into Martin Seligman, who did, of course, all the research on learned helplessness, and we saw that again in World War II. Um, as well, and we, you talk about adaption, habituation, and how we can be reduced to the sensitivity of it all. But I don't think people really recognize that the news media has had so much of a control over how much we do and react. And in this country, uh, you know, we have a president who's quite controversial, and it has created such a rift in our country mm-hmm. that there have been people, people who were once friends, now hate each other and detest <laughs> each other, and. Uh, people, are, people are literally, uh, I watched people get unfriended on Facebook and, mm-hmm. and never talk to each other again simply because of how they voted. And I'm like going, 
have you lost your mind? And then when I read this book, I was like, of course, of course, because we have become so convinced and we've become so cynical and so skeptical that what's happened is now we have this, these feelings of contempt, this, and I love how you wrote that increased feelings of contempt, increased hostility towards others. And it's, and there's huge, I think, I think especially, you know, with kind of, you know, personal politics, especially, you know, people, the way that politics is discussed, you know, the, the way in which the news frames debate very much, um, invites us to perhaps engage in a similar kind of way and the way in which the news kind of discusses politics you know like you said before you know if they're of a different opinion they're a liar and people kind of create this unity between someone's politics and someone's personality and so what is attack an attack on their um you know their political opinion becomes an, an attack on their character Absolutely. and what you're saying there about people defriending people it's exactly the same thing you know we've lost that um, that that distance to be able to discuss ideas we now discuss people behind those ideas so much more and it becomes such an identity of people um, that people really you know we've had the same thing over here with brexit you know whether you'll remain or you'll leave um, it's it's created a huge rift because rather than just being a political um, or you know it's, it's something to do with your society and your opinion to it it's become so much more than that. You know, it's become much deeper than that. And because one of the way, one of the reasons why is because the way in which the media frames these conversations is so personal. You know, it is so attacking on people and individuals um, rather than the on, on the ideas. You know, there's, they, we're not discussing the ideas as much as we're discussing the people promoting those ideas. Mm. And, and that's a really important distinction. It changes the way we behave towards each other, too. It is. And uh, by the way, talking to Jody Jackson, author of You Are What You Read, um, how changing your media diet can change the world. Uh, and we're discussing the psychological impacts and of, of how consuming the news media can actually affect us and how it does that. And uh, the book is chock full of all sorts of psychological um, pieces of how that actually happens to us. And uh, we become desensitized and we don't even realize what's happening to us at the time because we consume so much of it that we don't really know. Uh, why we do what we do or why we believe what we believe. We simply have been consuming so much media and it's just a beautiful piece of work and it's a piece of work that you need to buy and Amazon. It's a great read. I literally read it an entire day. I, I And it wasn't even an entire day. I sat down and I just flew through this book because it was so fantastic. And I think you will have the exact same experience I did. And it's just recently come out to the U.S. and it's called You Are What You Read. So make sure that you do that. Check out the book. Uh I, I think one of the things uh, about all of this that uh, that you that you've done here in this book, and I appreciate you doing all the research that you've done here, is because you're you're setting us up for an alternative. And and, and I know that you say it's not an alternative. I, I think what you're saying is I'm not trying to get rid of one. I'm just trying to add something to what we're currently <laughs> doing. And, and I know that's not what you're doing. I know that you're, you're not, because typically I know that people are thinking, I think because it gets so adversarial at the mm. news media level that I think it's so adversarial that anytime somebody starts to put a chink in your armor, because I think you say this in your book, right? I, I, did I misquote you as you, or maybe it was someone else, but I'm pretty sure you said, or you either said it in a book or you said it in a talk. That you know what it is the the news media is the one industry that can point fingers at every other industry but themselves. Yeah, that is <laughs> when you, when you say it on its own, it perhaps sounds slightly harsher than I meant it. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's it's certainly something. You know, the news industry. The thing is about the news is it is there to challenge the status quo. You know, it's to right. take an idea that's perhaps previously accepted in society and actually say. You know, is it still accepted? Should we still behave like this? Let's question it. You know, with today's standards, is this thing still acceptable? And the news doesn't necessarily, you know, when I've spoken to journalists in my <laughs> most hostile argument, uh, audience, or were at least, they're much more inviting and more curious about the idea of solutions journalism and, and what it can bring to their newsrooms and their profession. But initially, there was um, so much hostility, and I found it frustrating because for an industry that's built on challenging the status quo and, you know, looking at things differently and, and testing ideas and challenging, um, you know, accepted norms, they, they, they seemed reluctant to think, you know, that, that the news could be done differently. 
because you know the news is so important this is the way it serves society this is why it works and we're not going to change it that was that that was the kind of um rhetoric that i was up against about 10 years ago but it has changed you know maybe because the media is not working in the same way you know as much as their ideals are still very much the same um people are tuning out and and trust in the media has never been so low so they have got, kind of been able to with that feedback that you get through social media with this kind of two-way channel you'll be they're, they're able to reflect a little bit more on ways in which they're doing it what's useful what's not what's effective what's not um and perhaps you know create changes and so it's so encouraging for me to have been in this space for so long and actually see these genuine changes taking place and we're with jody jackson author of you are what you read and she is brought to you today by Inline Business Brokers and Advisors. I'm telling you, we are so grateful for them. They, uh, they listen. They, 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 they represent private, profitable, privately held companies with gross annual revenues in excess of a million dollars. They deliver the highest market value in shortest amount of time with complete confidentiality. That's our registered trademark. We appreciate them sponsoring a new direction. And you can learn more by going to nline.com. That's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors. If you happen to be in the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, what we call the Research Triangle Park area, why not stop down at 7300 Six Forks Road and get yourself a free bottle of water and say hello to Linda Craft and her team and find out why they are known for their legendary customer service. <clears throat> they are absolutely outstanding, and you can learn more by going to lindacraft.com, L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. And we're back here with Jody Jackson here on A New Direction. And Jody, I, I want to get finished the program here as we finish up slowly here. I want to, to start talking about what you just brought in, and that was the news solution. And, and that is uh, something that you started here, and that is Solutions Focused News. So why don't you tell the audience, what is solutions-focused news? I know that you've kind of touched on it, but what, how do we really define solution-focused news so that we know what we're looking at when we see it? So you're, you're, you're looking at, you know, it, it, is, it is rigorous journalism. You know, it, it's, it's not just celebrating solutions, it's reporting on them. And it's also identifying the kind of, you know, what the problem is as well you'll find solutions aren't isolated from the news narrative. You know, they're not just benevolent people doing incredible things. Um, it's, it's, usually, um, it's usually very grassroots. People who are affected most by the problems are usually the people who are creating the solutions. And so it's recognizing that when you go and report on a problem, that's not always the end of the story. So it's about widening the media lens, including the length of time that we ha perhaps take to report on an issue to be able to see it over a period rather than the initial impact of, of, of the problem. So, um, sorry, yeah. No, 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 no. You have no reason to apologize. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've cut you off. It's, it's, it's just that you, you said something and it uh, something ran across my mind in your book. And you did this New York Times, uh, you, you read this little New York Times study, I think it was, and you found out that positive contented stories are shared more frequently and reach larger, larger audiences over time. The negative ones do, mm. and and this this is all part of the whole idea, right? The the impetus, well, the part of the impetus behind solutions focused news, isn't it? That it's that it is engaging. Yes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's something that's really interesting to news organizations because one of the challenges that you hear when um, you talk about solutions focused news is, oh, no one cares about that. You know, people love bad news. People, you know, no news is good news, and. You, you have very much that very instilled way of thinking. Um, and so it's really powerful when actually you say, no, people do care. People really are interested. We've got the metrics to show right. there is an audience building around the desire for this kind of news. And in the, B, you know, the, in the UK, the BBC World Service, it did a survey of its readers and 64% of people under 35s wanted the news to report on solutions. And in fact, it was their top content request. And this is why, you know, my work is, is so focused on the consumer because we have a really powerful editorial role. You know, the news cares so much about what we engage with. And so if we can be conscious and deliberate and, and make choices that can help support a, a more constructive news narrative, they will pay attention. They'll listen to that and they'll respond and their demand will, will match what uh, their, their supply, sorry, will match what we're demanding. So, 
you know, we can't underestimate the role of the consumer in, in, in creating the kind of press that we have today, good and bad. I, I, cheers here. I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm clapping for you like crazy because I'm cheering you on with this. I, you, you, have, you I really am because gosh, we got to get this message out and, and people listen, you know what you, you, you have control. You have more control than you realize over the media. You, you really, really, really do. Because guess what? If they don't have the economics behind them, because you stop watching or you stop using, guess what happens? They got to change. And um, and 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 listen. I know that sounds dramatic and drastic. You know, it's kind of what us Americans sometimes do. But it it. But the fact of the matter is, we have uh, an, a much more control of it. Jody, there's a couple things. I want to address uh, with you as well because I love the chapter Hopeless versus Hopeful. Thanks. And you, that was my favorite tip. Yeah, I, no, it really was. It was my favorite because you, you you spoke my language three words: optimism, hope, and self-efficacy. And you say that those three those three things are the armor worn to give us courage to address the problems head on. And I know that Freud had his issues with optimism, and people sometimes confuse optimism with blind optimism. But why is hope? Why is hope and optimism and self-efficacy so important to um, what we are trying, what you're trying to achieve, what you're saying to achieve when it comes to solutions-focused news? Um, well, they're really important psychological ingredients to um, actually enable us to do something with the information. Um, you know, optimism. Optimism is it's a belief about the future. You know, if it's a belief that the future can be better than the past, not that it will be better. Like you said, it's not blind optimism. It's not saying despite whatever's happening in the world, the future is going to be better. You know, that's that's not what we're talking about. But it's a belief that the future can be better, that there is the possibility that we're able to create a better world. And and that's that's a really important thing, because when you believe when you have that belief, it gives you something called active coping which actually enables you to approach the problem because you have a belief that you're able to move beyond it. You're able to create something better. And so not only does it give you the courage to approach the problem, it actually also gives you the kind of endurance to be able to persevere if you don't solve it straight away. If you're pessimistic, on the other hand, you know, if you have the belief that the future can't be better, then you're less likely to try, let alone persevere if you stumble across a problem. So this this kind of um, feeling about what the future can look like is a really important one to actually um, engage us with the problem. The second one is self-efficacy. You know, this is hugely, hugely important because this is the belief that your actions are able to make a difference. So this is what empowers you as an individual to be able to confront a problem either in your own life, in your own community, or even on a global level. Um, you know, if you think the future can be better than the past and you believe your actions are able to make a difference. That's a really powerful combination to actually participating constructively. And, um, you know, hope, where kind of hope fits into all of this is hope is kind of optimism with action. It's sort of the meeting point between, um, you know, thinking the future can be better and, and feeling able to do something. You know, hope usually has an action plan associated with it. So, it, it you know, it's optimism with action. And... And they're, you know, they're, they're really important things. And, and what's really important as well to know about hope, and this is perhaps why I think hope is my favorite out of all of them, because hope exists in the presence of a problem, not in the absence of one. You know, in order for us to have hope, we have to be sat dissatisfied with where we are now. We have to be, um, you know, either angry at the current situation, feel a sense of injustice. There has to be something that's triggering us to say this is not okay and, and visualize a better future. And so, you know, when we're talking about solutions journalism, problems-focused journalism, some people think we're trying to replace one with the other and say, don't listen to problems, just listen to solutions. And what hope's really useful in helping us communicate is no, listen to problems. It's really important. It creates a sense of anger and injustice. But we need to see examples of progress so that we can believe the future can be better. And we need to see examples of progress so that we're able to, you know, see people 
um, doing things to make a difference and know that we're capable of that ourselves. And so one of the things when we're talking about solutions news reporting, I always say, you know, don't report on the person instigating change as much as the process they're doing to do it, because otherwise we kind of create this hero narrative where this person is beyond what we could be capable of ourselves. And so what I, I'm really keen on, on demonstrating is, as, you know, it's not it's not extraordinary people. It's ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And we can all be one of them. But we need the right information to to move us in that direction. Uh, I am speechless because I just want to shout amen. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm yeah, I, there's just was this huge smile on my face as you were speaking, and uh, I'm blown away. I am absolutely blown away by you. I'm blown away uh, that you have taken this on. I'm blown away that you are just so, um, so you you this is really so passionate about it, and it's so important. And I, and the listeners that are out there, I hope you heard her passion, and I hope you heard how well. Um, articulated she is about being able to construct this argument and why we need this the whole idea of a solutions focused media not to replace it but to add with it so that we can come up with the solutions and we can have hope and you know how i feel about hope folks um you know what if, when you lose hope you lose life and and uh so i am a big believer uh, her name is jody jackson the book is entitled you are what you read jody we have been on together for about an hour and uh it's gone really fast for me yes, thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it, it it has been uh it has been an utmost honor and a privilege and a pleasure to thank have you, you uh, on the show and also um to give your time from london england because i know there's an hour difference here so thank you for uh, escaping away from your children <laughs> and um which i know are small and young and so uh thank you very much for doing that so I tell all my guests who become friends because I'm gonna. I believe that you and I are gonna become really great friends going forward. And uh, I always ask them uh, at the end of the show if you could give the listeners a new direction. If Jody Jackson could give our listeners a new direction on when it comes to media consumption and you are what you read, what would Jody Jackson say? I mean, unless you, <laughs> I'm sure you probably gathered it throughout this last hour, but my, my, my number one recommendation would be to tune in to some really good quality solutions focused news. Awesome. That's fantastic. Her name's Jody Jackson. The book is titled, You Are What You Read, Why Changing Your Media Diet Can Change the World. Folks, this is a new direction. You've been watching. You've been listening. Thank you, everybody. Facebook Live, CastBox FM Live. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, The Oak, 93.5. Thank you, world, right? UK, you know what? One of your very own. I got so many people from the UK who listen to the show. Thank you so much. I am so grateful for all of you and all the boroughs and places all around London, uh, around Wimbledon and all those other places, Brampton and and uh, somewhere something on the, somewhere in the Thames out there. You got, you got so many of you, so many. I am so grateful to you. So one of your very own has been on the show, and I am so grateful for her. Folks, uh, as I say every week, you know what? Be inspired because when you're inspired, that means that you will inspire other people. And in turn, as they're inspired, they inspire others. And that can make this world a great place. And so I'm going to see you next week with another great guest because you know what? It's always great because the guests are so amazing and I am so grateful. So until next week, you know what I say? Ciao, everybody. confidence and the answers don't make sense you got to keep your hope alive you got to know you can survive